Okay, well, as you know, this is the first Sunday when we will be doing a discussion group after service. For those of you who want to talk about uh, anything involving the Bible, uh, anything I've shared over these past three weeks, anything in general, and we'll meet, I think, in the, uh, the far end of the cafeteria so that we can all grab a cup of coffee and be comfortable and relaxed. Last week, we sort of galloped through, really, we galloped through the entire Torah, the entire uh, first five books. Is this, is that how we, is it sounds to me, or are you okay? It's kind of that way. Okay. Uh, we, we took it, uh, we saw an overview. And I'm becoming so aware, as I get older, I think, of the importance of an overview. The importance of stepping back, stepping up to that upper room that Jesus calls us to. Not to escape the world, but to understand the world from a higher perspective. And we looked last week at, at the flow of energy out of the garden into duality out of duality into lack and out of lack into Egypt. And Egypt representing a, a mastery of this particular experience we're having, this two-dimension, three-dimension world, this dualistic good and bad world. It was very confusing to us for a long time. We made a lot of mistakes. We learned a lot of lessons. We learned that you know, we shouldn't really kill each other because it's kind of a permanent thing. We didn't know that, so we learned that. We learned a lot of, a lot of lessons, and the Bible is full of you know, wonderful little, tiny instances and incidents that that um, offer us a glimmer of understanding into something we may be going through ourselves. And we saw that that Egypt can become a trap. We got very comfortable being in this dualistic world and um, mastered it. Egypt was outstanding in terms of education, in terms of abundance, in terms of everything, the arts. Um, even to go to Egypt today is to see, just to be awed by the, what they accomplished back then, thousands of years ago. Thousands. And the, the appeal of this world can become a distraction. It can, be, it can enslave us as the Hebrew people who represent metaphysically all the thoughts in our mind, as they became enslaved in Egypt. They went there, they were welcome, they were good. You know, they could buy their own homes, they could, every, everything was fine, and they were hired to build pyramids or whatever. But slowly, over time, not too much time, uh, that ominous sentence at the beginning of Exodus, a pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph. You know, is, it, is that always the case? Eventually someone comes along who doesn't know the way we've always done things and decides to do things differently. And they became enslaved, just as we become enslaved to the distractions of this world. It's not just addictions, although I and many of us, I think, can speak to the, the power of addiction, of becoming addicted to something that was once a pleasure, you know, and then all of a sudden we realize we're not in my case, I'm not drinking because I really want to drink. I'm drinking because I have to. I'm drinking because I need the alcohol. And along comes Moses. That spark of spirit. Is, as long as we remember that divine mind is always within us. We, are all, we all have really two minds. We have spirit mind, which knows the truth has never faltered in knowing the truth. We have mortal mind, which serves a really important purpose of getting us through 
this experience without hurting ourselves too badly. You know? And the problem becomes the problem comes when mortal mind begins to think that it is in charge and it knows how to move from here to there and how what, what everything should mean and what what everything should what, what everything that we should do. And the, the challenge is to reconnect with spirit mind, allowing spirit mind to be the source of energy for mortal mind. So that we're not, we're not, did not, we're not trying to eliminate the mortal mind. We're trying to put it in its proper place. We're trying to allow it to serve spirit in ways that are important. Yeah. I said we, we, we put the first five books, and we really did because the other four books, uh, the other three books in um, the Torah all concern that particular experience, that experience the, the book we call Numbers in Hebrew is, is known as In the Wilderness because it begins in the wilderness. And it contains stories of things that happened in the wilderness. Leviticus is primarily laws, rules, and regulations that we, our mortal minds created inspired by spirit on good days when we were connected um, and it's it's dense and uh, difficult to read and there's not a lot of purpose to reading it because it really pertains to laws and, and directives that no longer that were important for uh, a nomadic tribe back then but that really it's really a stretch to apply them to our consciousness today. As Jesus kept pointing out, if you haven't grown in awareness from Leviticus, then you've got a problem. You know, Jesus was always saying, don't take, don't quote Leviticus to me. I know Leviticus. That was then, this is now. And that's even more true now. Uh, it's historically fascinating. And then Deuteronomy is a retelling of the whole thing. Supposedly, it is presented as Moses speaking for himself. Three uh, talks that he gave to the people just before he left. He, was, he knew he would not be allowed into the promised land, and they were, they were getting close. He gave three talks, uh, not a here, and walked away, and nobody knows what happened to him since. Went up into the mountains and, uh, and ended his particular life experience. So that's the, that's the flow uh, from our, from our birth when we are still spiritual beings. I love, I have always loved doing baptisms, christenings as a minister, because I look in those the baby's eyes and I see a spiritual being saying, what the hell is going on here? You know, I did not know I was getting into, I did not, not know I'd be so limited, I'd be so weak, I'd be so, and nobody will listen to me. And, uh, we have to learn that we are now in a, an experience of duality, so uh, we have to get used to that. We have to get comfortable with it. And then as we do, we grow older and we, you know, we understand duality is all around us. Everybody's, trying, everybody's teaching it to us. And we get absorbed in it. We start making a little bit of money, and a little bit of prestige, a little bit of travel, whatever it is that really appeals to us. And the danger is that we can become uh, enslaved by it. All of a sudden, we've forgotten our spiritual truth altogether. We've forgotten the first and second of our principles, that God is a God of love everywhere present. And we forget the second principle, that I, I am an expression of that love. We focus on other things. And we have to be pulled back. We have to be pulled back. And it, it is the spirit within us who sends that. And you know, it'd be interesting to go around and talk about just what first led you to explore, good morning, to explore unity. Um, there was that spark that said, you, you know, I, I'm not okay. Uh, I need something. I need to be guided to the right place. For me, it was. I had moved to Chicago. I was 
wildly successful, if I may say so, as a theater director, which is what I always thought I wanted to do and be. And it didn't feel right. It fell off. It felt, I thought, I should be enjoying this more than I am. And that led me to unity. And <laughs> who knew, right? So we see the overall picture. It's also important to look at the stories within that overall picture, because each one is there for a reason. Each one is there because at some time we're going to need that information. The Bible, as I've said before, is a roadmap, the roadmap that we are invited to follow as we discover and then begin to undertake our spiritual journey here on Earth. Uh, it guides us all. It doesn't make judgments. It doesn't say, you, you stupid idiot, you shouldn't be there. You should be over here instead. Um, it simply shows us the range of possibilities. And it shows us that range through stories. This is a story about what will happen if you, you know, if you place other things before God. If you make physical things your master. Um, you can do that if you want to. It's going to take you on detours that you, you know, will take a long time to recover from. But you can do that. But here's a more direct route that allows you to move faster if you simply know your truth and stay connected to it. Um, but it's up to you. you know, the Bible is not judgmental. It's just helpful. And the, the story that I've been focusing on this week in my own work, because I love it so much, um, is the story of Jacob. I have always felt that... Um, I always felt connected to Jacob in a very profound way. My Bible teacher at ministerial school used to say, after, I, after he read a couple of my opinion papers, especially I wrote a paper on why Paul is so ridiculous and we should not listen to Paul, and, and uh, he wrote on the back page, I think perhaps you are Paul. <laughs> um, now I think perhaps if I'm anybody it would be Jacob. And we can see in Jacob the, the lines of the hero's journey that is going to carry us through here. Um, he, he actually is one of the most prominent characters. He, his life begins in chapter 25 of Genesis and goes all the way through to the final chapter of Genesis, which is, which is chapter 50. And he's not always you know, center stage through all of that. His son Joseph takes over after a while, but he's always there. And he's always influencing what happens what happens around him, whether he knows it or not. His his sons are always saying, what would dad say? What would dad do? You know. Um, so it's a it's an extraordinary long life. And it begins in a very ordinary way. Uh, he is he is a twin. And uh, his mother, Rebecca, uh, was having trouble with carrying the, the twins. And she went to, uh, who knows, a soothsayer, an oracle, something, someone who said, you are carrying two nations inside you, and they will always be in competition. And, uh, well, let me, let me pick it up there. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in, the, in her womb. The first came forth red to all his body like a hairy mantle. So they called him Esau, which means hairy. Afterward, his brother came forth, and his hand had taken hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, because Jacob means the supplanter. And the assumption is that he was trying to be the firstborn of the twins because being firstborn in that society gives you a lot of perks as life goes on. Um, so he became known immediately as the supplanter. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Eric, um, Isaac loved Esau because he needed his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And then we come into the first interesting story, just briefly. 
Once when Jacob was boiling pottage, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red pottage, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom, in parentheses there, because um, he is considered the father of the Edomites, the, uh, the tribe that Israel had to contend with through, uh, through all of their existence in, in, the, uh, in their holy land. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of the lentils, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, a birthright at that, in that society meant that he, the eldest son was entitled to two-thirds of the estate when the father died. The younger son would get a third. Esau just sold that. That's the birthright. So he's, he's now no longer going to get the, the eldest son's share. Jacob is going to do that. And we know what happens next. Rebecca, who should be minding her own business, perhaps, says, yeah, that's not good enough. I think, I think you need the blessing, too, from, from Isaac. And the blessing is what is a power thing. It's what would make the person receiving the blessing the head of that spiritual community, the head of that Hebrew nation that is still living in tents. Um, and that is going to come to, to Esau because he's the eldest. And Rebecca comes up with an idea. And you know the idea. Go get a goat, put, make sleeves for yourself so you feel hairy like Esau. And uh, your father's blind anyway. He won't know the difference. Just go in there and you know, let him feel your arm and then get his blessing. And it works. It's exactly what happens. But choices have consequences, don't they? And the consequence is that Rebecca loses her favorite son for pretty much the rest of her life. He has to flee because Esau is so furious. Um, so he flees into the wilderness. The, he, the hero's journey that we have talked about so often that I work with almost constantly begins with a call to adventure. And the call to adventure here is Rebecca saying, Jacob, I've got, I've got an idea. Go and deceive your father and get a birthright that isn't, again, a blessing that isn't really yours. Now remember, all the way back to the womb, Esau was, was grabbing, I mean, <laughs> Jacob was grabbing at Esau, trying to pull him back so that he, Jacob, could be the first out. So you know, but this is not a new idea. Jacob at first says, no, I don't think so. I mean, we're probably new about Jacob. He, he, hangs out, he, he has no real interests. He's a quiet guy who lives in tents, you know, um, reading and who knows, cooking, whatever. Um, but there's nothing to suggest that he's ambitious, that he wants more property, that he wants more anything. He's willing to, willing to accept situations as they come. There's always a temptation to say no when we get a call to adventure. And we get a call from Andrew pretty much every day, uh, in one way or another. You know, my favorite example is Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit, who says, I, I, I'm perfectly content where I am. I don't need to follow some dwarves and a wizard you know, into a, a great adventure. And he later says in the book, as I look back years later, I never knew what it was that prompted me to wake up and run to catch up with that, because I was sure <clears throat> I wasn't going to go. And that can happen to us too, can't it? <clears throat> we think, oh no, I don't think that's a good idea. And Spirit says, well, you're going anyway. You might as well make it a good idea. Rebecca 
we reach a threshold where we are, we, we realize if we take one more step, we are committing ourselves to this journey, to this particular adventure. And we step over, we, we take that step, and in Jacob's case, he decides to run for his life. And then he finds himself in the wilderness, as we always do, as Moses and the Hebrews did, as you and I do. Because we don't know, we don't quite know what we just did or what the implications of it are or how, what's going to happen next. And we always receive some kind of spiritual support. Uh, a sympathetic headmaster, if you're a Harry Potter fan, or, there's always something. Glenda the Good Witch in Wizard of Oz. And for Jacob, it's even more direct than that. He comes to a place in the wilderness, and now this is a man who is part of the wealthiest family in his tribe, so he's used to, you know, nice things. He has no place to sleep, so he lays down and uses a, a, a stone as his pillow. And there in the wilderness, he has a dream, and he sees a ladder, and angels, and angels always represent divine ideas, coming down and going up, coming down and going up in a constant flow. And at the top is the Lord of his being, who repeats the promise he made to his ancestor, uh, his grandfather, uh, Abraham. You are going to be a great people, and through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So even though you're lying on a rock and uh, have no idea where your next meal is coming from, don't worry. It's all going to work out. Those spiritual, that little something that says you're not alone in this, you're never as alone as you think you are. So we move along, he moves along, and experiences the lessons and challenges of the hero's journey. Um, we learn as we go, we strengthen ourselves, we prepare ourselves for the ultimate uh, challenge that awaits us at the end. And we learn these lessons. You know, Jacob goes to his kinsman, his mother's brother, Laban, and um, the deceiver is deceived. He falls in love on the spot with Rachel, and Laban says, okay, fine, work for me for seven years. You can marry my daughter, Rachel. And in one of the most love-centered lines in the Bible, we're told that this Seven years seemed like a day to Jacob, so great was his love. Um, so the great wedding day comes, and you know the bride comes out, heavenly veiled, and they, were there. they have the ceremony, they go into the tent, they, can cons they, can, they consummate the marriage. And the next morning, Jacob discovers that it's not Rachel at all, it's her elder sister, Leah. And Laban says, it's how we do things around here. It's, it's the custom of the country. We never allow the younger daughter to get married before the older. So if you work another seven years, I'll let you marry Rachel too. And he does. He works seven years. And there are many, many stories in there. Uh, Laban is always trying to trick him, and he's always trying to trick Laban. And there are lots of lessons uh, to be learned. And he becomes quite wealthy on his own power. I mean, this isn't money he inherits from his father. This is, he earns a great deal of money and great herds and, um, you know, his wives and his and concubines and serving girls. And, but there's always something missing for him. There's always something that says, you have to make it up with Esau. You know, you really have to. You really have to deal with this. You can't just ignore it. You can't just put it in the past. Now, he hasn't heard from Esau since he left. He has no idea uh, what he will find. He assumes that Esau is going to be furious and will probably try to kill him, but he has to do this. So he packs up all his wealth, all his belongings, all his wives, and off he troops through the desert to the land of his birth to confront his brother. And in one of the great, great, great moments of the Bible, um, 
when, when he hears that Esau is, is nearing, is coming close, he sends all of his people, all of his retinue, all of his sheep and goats and everything, away across the river, and he stays behind. And he wrestles with an angel through the night. And it's one of the most beautiful, um, well, it's, it's a very, unions in particular, um, use it are very, very wonderful in interpreting and understanding the, the symbology of it all, because it gets very confusing. Uh, as, the, as the moves along, the, the, per, the pronouns become very confusing, and it, pretty soon he's the angel, and the angel is him, and you can't tell one from the other. And finally, when dawn breaks, the angel says, no bad, you know, you really stuck it out, and you deserve a new name, and that name is Israel, which means father of nations. And to remember him by, he puts his head up to it, which is tradition, you know, to this day, Jewish men feel they're prone to a hip dislocation. Um, and that's, that happens to us too often, doesn't it? We, we move through our challenges. We learn the lesson. We persevere. And there will always be something that reminds us. You know, a, a bit of pain, a person that we see every now and then. There are many ways in which we can be reminded of how we got where we are. Jacob goes forward. Esau is thrilled to see his brother. They, you know, they fall into each other's arms and weep and probably sit up all night sharing stories. Uh, remember, they're twins, so twins have a very special bond anyway, so there's a sense of completion here. Uh, and then they go their separate ways. Esau goes back to his land and his people, the Edomites, and, and uh, Jacob stays with his people and begins to prosper even more more and more prosperity, more and more kids. Um, and so it goes along. One, he has children by Leah, Leah his children by Rachel, to, and he's, of course, they're his favorites, especially Joseph. And there we go off into another patriarch, another story, and many more lessons for us. So what, why shall I read this now? Well, there, I think there's a, a couple of reasons. One very practical and one uh, less so, one more mystic. The practical one is that these stories are a part of our culture. They're, they're points of reference um, that really need to know if we're going to fully grok our cult, this culture that we have chosen to be born into. Great help. Great help. That's why every culture has its wonderful stories, you know, whether it's uh, Hindu stories or the, the Jewish Torah or the Quran. Um, even those religions that are not considered based in books still have stories that allow people to understand spiritual truths in simple ways. The mystical point is that this is in miniature. The journey that the Bible is going is about in totality. And it is what Bible scholars would call a precursor story. Because there are many ways in which we can see Jacob as a precursor of Jesus. Um, we can see that the challenges are the same. Jesus is going to go through a similar hero's journey on a higher on a higher dimension, but this is this is like a world pact, okay? Um, so it's important that we get from this all the help we can, both positive and negative. You know, I like to go back and work with Rebecca. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, she was really the patri the matriarch of the tribe because Isaac sat in his tent. We're told he never came out of his tent. I think that whole sacrifice. Uh, then scarred him for life, and he just decided to hell with it. So it is really Rebecca who is making the choices, who is leading the people. And it is her choices, 
that cause a lot of the problems, that cause a lot of the conflict, that cause the separation. And it's not a bad thing. It's not, she's not a bad person who made mistakes because it works out well. You know, it, it all comes down to the marvelous statement that Joseph is going to make at the end of his ministry when his brothers come to him and say, oh God, we're so sorry about that whole prison thing. I mean, you know, was, we were just kidding. We didn't, we didn't know. And he says, it doesn't matter. You meant it for evil to do harm against me. God meant it for good. God meant it for good. And that, that was the choice that Joseph made that allowed all that whole experience to transform. So in Hebrews' journey terms, we see, we see Isaac going through the dark night of the soul, that death and rebirth. He comes, he goes in as Jacob, he comes out as Israel. He, his personal challenges, his personal life, suddenly become uh, universal. Suddenly he resumes his position as head of the tribe. He hasn't been head of the tribe because he hasn't been with the tribe for a long time. Uh, so there's, there's an acceptance of a new role, a new name, a new role. There's also a period of a need for atonement. He has, to get, he has to make it up with, with Esau. He can't just ignore him and say, well, that was then, you know, that was, I made a bad choice. I'm sorry about that, but I'm going forward. No, you need to be at peace with your own journey. And that's where lifting to a higher perspective can be so useful because we can see that even though we meant it to do harm, we can see the good. And we can forgive ourselves for what we've for what we've done. So one character, one story, one life. Your character, your story, your life. You could go back and it's a very useful thing to do and place events in your life in a, the structure of the hero's journey. It's very interesting to realize that there was much more going on and there was always more going on than you realized at the time. So what can you learn from Jacob? Well, Several things occur to me at once. You are never alone. And you can be in the wilderness sleeping on a stone, but God is with you. The creative energy, the divine within you is never going to leave you, never going to abandon you. You will always be one with divine mind. You will always be one with spirit. Uh, choices have consequences. You, know, you can make this choice if you want. The consequences you're going to have to leave time pretty quickly. And the other one is that desires may be delayed, but they're not denied. You know, Jacob could easily have stomped off after his first wedding night and said, I was cheated to hell with all of you, and, and lost the opportunity to be with Rachel. Another seven years, you get your full, your, your full desire. So his desires are de often delayed. You know, I mean, often we see the wedding tent and we, I, you know, I think I know how this desire is going to be answered and I go confidently into the tent to claim my good and it isn't there. What's up with that? And the answer is, you're not ready yet. You have some more, a few more lessons to learn before you're ready to claim your good. So it always comes down to, I think, the most helpful and the important question we can keep in mind as we move forward, whether we're looking at a particular story or whether we're taking a higher view. And that is, uh, how may this be a blessing? In my own life, look at a challenge. Think of a challenge you're having now. Think of, as we were talking about before the service, think of Donald Trump and the administration is gathering and say, how may this be a blessing? Well, it is a blessing because it's awakening people to claim their power and to stand up and say, I don't think so. You know, we've been very sort of casual about this amazing country that we live in, this amazing governmental system. And it's time to say, wait a minute, 
you know, I want to, I, I want to be heard here. So it can be a blessing. Everything is a blessing. How is this a blessing in my life? Something awful is happening. I'm losing my job. How is this a blessing in my life? My relationship is ending. How is this a blessing in my life? Sometimes we don't even want to ask the question because it feels like even asking the question diminishes the importance of what's happening. No. It just gives it a new perspective. Even, you know, someone close to me has died. How is this a blessing in my life? You know, there's always a way. We know that death that has no reality. The, the individual is moving on with his or her spiritual journey. How is this a blessing online? How does this help my journey? Next two weeks from now, we'll move forward into the promised land and discover that it ain't all milk and honey the way we thought it was going to be. Uh, and we will get into Judges and First and Second Kings, for those of you who are following along in the Bible, and I'm sure all of you are. And remember, we will be together at 1 o'clock, back at the cafeteria, to answer any questions or to extend this discussion, whatever you'd like to do. It's your, it's your discussion group. Thank you. Many blessings.